He didn't really go for it, but there it was. What he used to call the prize. My dad said, fucking hell, Sid. What the fuck do you think we're going to do with that? This is Stealing Victory. The untold story of the 1966 World Cup heist. Episode 7, The Prize. A tip-off from an underworld source of mine had claimed a crook known as Sidney Q had stolen the World Cup in 1966. He had never been caught and his identity had remained secret for over 50 years. My name is Tom Pettifor and I'm the crime editor at the Daily Mirror. It had taken 10 months, but I was on the brink of putting the final pieces of the jigsaw together. I'd established that Sidney Q was in fact Sidney Q Galea. He was born in 1926, had a brother called Freddie, and lived just off the Woolworth Road. He'd been charged in the early 60s with going equipped for theft. It all fitted. Birth, marriage and death records showed that Q Galea had died in 2005, age 79. I was too late to speak to him myself, but I tracked down one of his friends. After an initial refusal, the man seemed to be warming to me. All I had to do was wait. So you want to know about Sidney Q. Galea, do you? Well, I knew the man well. I knew the man very well indeed. The message came and I went to meet him near a South London park. We sat in his car so we could talk without being overheard. I'd verified who he was from official records and I gave him a guarantee that he would remain a confidential source. For that reason, his words are spoken by an actor and we've changed his name to Bobby. Many a time, Sid would say he was the first Englishman to lift the World Cup in 1966 and that he did it before Bobby Moore. I mean, he lifted it in both senses. He lifted it over his head and he fucking lifted it, didn't he? He nicked it. Bobby is in his 60s. He has a strong South London accent and uses the language of older villains. He talks about going on his toes, meaning going on the run, about having a tickle, coming into some money. Checks I made showed that he'd known Sidney Cugalier for decades. Bobby said he'd spent his life on the fringes of crime and mentioned some well-known criminals he said he'd known. Sid was basically an old school thief. I would say he was never violent, but you couldn't leave anything to chance with Sid. He knew a lot of the heavy boys. He worked with a lot of the heavy boys, but as I said, he was never violent. He was a very private man. That's why he was so successful at what he did. He was secretive. My searches showed that Cugalier had done many years in jail, but I could find only a handful of mentions of him in the newspaper archives. He wasn't named in any of the many autobiographies and books written by and about his contemporaries. To be a successful criminal, it helps to avoid the limelight as Q. Galea had done until his death. He was a clever old boy, a fantastic brain for anything crooked. He was a planner and would see things we wouldn't see in a month of Sundays. He would look at a job properly before saying yes or no to it. Bobby said that Q. Galea had first told him in the 1980s that he had stolen the Jules Rimet trophy. Sid was always having a laugh. He thought things was funny. He took the World Cup home and he put it on the mantelpiece in their three-storey house in Penrose Street. And now come in, she was a proper old cockney. And he said, yeah, I've got that for you. And they were sitting down having their tea and then it come on the telly, the World Cup. And suddenly it was, you effing bastard, you've nicked that. What have you done this time? Get it out. He said she battered him. But Q Galea was not a man of good character in the eyes of the law. How could I be sure he hadn't made all this up? There was more work to be done. In the meantime, I checked birth, marriage and death records and went back to the National Archives to find out all I could about him. Born in 1926, he was the eighth of nine siblings and grew up by the East Street Market off the Woolworth Road, one of the poorest parts of London. At that time, there was no welfare state or National Health Service. He used to steal to feed the family, Sid. They used to go and nick food, break into dairies to get eggs and things like that to feed themselves. Then as he got older, he got bolder. Sid told me his old man was spiteful. He was a bit useful with his hands, with the kids and with his mum. In them days, it was the days of the pub. The man would go to the pub and get drunk, and if the wife didn't like it, he would give her a slap. Many of them still do, but it's never been my thing. Cugalier's father, William, was described in official records as a scavenger and general labourer. He married Rose in 1907. It was a harsh world and death was never very far away. 
The couple's first child, Ada, passed away aged two in 1910, while her sister, Nellie, died at birth the same year. The area they lived in was a breeding ground for criminals, including the Richardson brothers, Eddie and Charlie, Mad Frankie Fraser and Hatton Garden mastermind Brian Reader. According to Bobby, Cugalier knew them all. He went to an approved school. He did a bit of bird on the moor. He was one of the first, and he did some bird with Ruby Sparks and Frankie Fraser. They all knew each other and came from the same area. If you went in a pub, there'd be the Frasers, the Brindles, the Richardsons, the Arises. And they was all families from Camberwell, Woolworth, the Elephant and Castle, them areas. They all come from there, and they used to work together. Approved schools were residential institutions for young offenders. When Bobby talks about Cugalier doing Bird on the Moor, he's referring to his time in Dartmoor Prison. And Ruby Sparks was a burglar who got his nickname after stealing £45,000 worth of rubies from a Maharaja's house in Mayfair. Charlie and Eddie Richardson had been at war with the Cray Twins when the World Cup was stolen. It led to the yard coming down hard, and they were rounded up on the day of the final. The so-called torture trial at the Old Bailey the following year heard how, with the help of sadistic Frankie Fraser, they beat and electrocuted their rivals, sometimes yanking out their teeth. They drank at the Good Intent pub on the East Street Market, around the corner from Cugalier's home. Since getting my original tip-off in 2017, I'd returned to the area a few times looking for people who might remember Sydney. On one trip, I met this market trader. Well, the pub over there used to be Frankie Fraser, yeah. and that used to be his brother's pub, okay. and he used to drink in there, and the Richardsons. He was covered in tattoos and wore a neck brace. We chatted as he worked a stall selling tracksuits and winter jackets. Did you ever know a guy called Sydney Coo? Sydney Coo? No. He had a brother called Freddie. Freddie Cougalier, who was called. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Did, did you know him? Yeah. Yeah. What, what was he like? Uh, everybody around him was a bit, a bit naughty. Yeah. <laughs> if he weren't nailed down, no, they'd, they'd nick it right. around here. Yeah. And that, right. And so I'm not surprised that they stole it. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it used to be really good down here, though. Did it? It's all changed now. It's all fruit and veg. But there used to be some real characters down there. Right. What sort of stuff? Anything what you can get off the back of a lorry. Would it be in the market where they'd sell it then? Or in the pub or would it just be In the everywhere? pub, yeah. on the stalls. Yeah, it used to be good. He couldn't remember much about the Cugalier brothers. He said they kept a low profile except for when they had stuff to sell. He's 72 years old and his stories give us a feel for Cugalier's London. I mean, I used to be a bit of a villain myself. Right. And that, like, you know, so I, I've had my moments. Right, have you, yeah. mm. Did you end up getting caught then, or...? No, I've got away. Oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> I've been interviewed. Right, OK, well, that's good. They, they had a little chat with you. I used to have Frankie Fraser and all those, so I never had any trouble. No. And that. But all the villains, they've all died out now. Because this area had a reputation for being one of the toughest sort of parts of London, didn't it? Yeah, well, I originally come from Bermondsey, and, like, Bermondsey boys was a bit naughty. Yeah. And the elephant mob yeah. and Woolworth, yeah. uh, bad as well. Yeah. And yeah. they all had their reputation. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, where I come from is the Arifs. Yeah. I don't know if you know the oh, Arifs. Yeah, yeah. I went to school with them. Did you? Right. Yeah. yeah. So where and, in Bermondsey was that? Uh, Jamaica Road. Yeah. And that down by uh, the docks. docks. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. it family doctors? Or? No, I worked on the docks. You did as well. And um, I used to feed off the docks. Right. And that. Yeah. On, on the river boats. Yeah. And the police boats used to come in and they can't catch you. So you'd be on a boat? I used to climb on the barges, nicking whatever they had. What, the light, the light, the, the Thames light, I mean, barges? Or... Yeah. Right. And that. And we used to nick salmon and silk and whatever there was on there. The when are we talking here then, when you were young, young? Yes, yeah, 60s, 70s. The barges he talked about stealing from were the same boats that Pickles' owner, Dave Corbett, used to operate as a young man. He said everyone knew which police officers took bribes and which ones were straight. And we've just heard him talking about the Arifs, once a leading London crime family who had been around since the 1960s. 
One of seven brothers, Bekir Arif, known as the Duke, was jailed for 23 years in 1999 over a plot to supply 100 kilograms of heroin worth 12.5 million pounds. The Arifs were among the crime families that Bobby told me Kugalir used to drink with. They protection racket. Yeah. They took over the West End. Did they? Yep. Yeah. And I was there down the foresters one <laughs> night, and the West End mob came in and chopped him up with axes. Chopped him up. Arif. Right. They chopped him up with axes. Didn't kill him. Right. And that. Did you see it happen? I was there. What happened? We was drinking. And the next thing we know, he was gone. And they just whipped him out, chopped him up, and we found him outside. What, what did he look like? A mess. What did they use on him? <laughs> Axes. 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 Jesus. Yeah. That was Cugalier's world. Being sent to an approved school as a boy and then spending time in Dartmoor Prison was a training ground for a life of crime. According to Bobby... Cugalier fell in with a tight team of safe blowers who robbed post offices up and down the country. Some of what Bobby says can be verified from the records. A cutting in the Coventry Evening Telegraph from 1954, when Cugalier was 28, shows that his brother Freddie was found tied hand and foot following a robbery worth £80,000 in today's money. The safe that he had supposedly been guarding in King's Cross had been emptied. It seems the brothers got away with that one, as the report described Freddy as a victim. And then there's this cutting from 1961. Sidney Cugalier, street trader of no fixed address, was sentenced yesterday to four years' imprisonment on a charge of robbery with violence and stealing four mailbags containing £10,553. Mr Justice Howard told Cugalier, You have a very bad record, but I'm not sentencing you on that. Just two years before the great train robbery and Cugalier had already spotted there was money to be made stealing mailbags. £10,000 in 1961 is worth over £200,000 in today's money. The robbery was in Doncaster, South Yorkshire, in the north of England. My original source told me Cugalier had a house and a mistress somewhere up north. So though Bobby tells us his friend didn't use violence, the records show he did, certainly when he was a younger man. Cugalier was released from prison in April 1964. He married Nell Hetty Hoare the following month and he claimed in later appeal court application that he went straight for seven years. Crucially, the records show he was free and living in Woolworth on the day the cup was stolen. So you'd have specialist tools for the job then? They would open certain locks. I, I remember him having another set which I didn't get, which was slightly different to these, which would open different locks. Right. So these ones, I would say, are good for padlocks. That's Cugalier's nephew, Gary. One of the few possessions he left behind was his set of skeleton keys, testament to his life as a professional burglar. Gary lives in Norfolk, 150 miles or so out of London on the east coast. The tranquil countryside is a far cry from the bustling streets of south-east London. Gary's dad, Reggie, was Sydney's best mate, and his Norfolk home was one of Cugalier's several bolt holes. Gary is a crane operator on oil rigs in the North Sea, a family man whose love of his dad and uncle is obvious. I met him after some brilliant work by my Daily Mirror colleague Louis Smith, who first spoke to him. Gary's 50 now, but when he was a teenager, his dad told him his version of the World Cup theft story. We were sitting in the back conservatory and he went, yeah... Oh, you'd be surprised what me and Sid had done. And, and I was going, yeah, go on in. So, well, you know, the World Cup, to be honest. I'm not even bothered about football. Well, not even interested. The World Cup, what? Football World Cup? And he was like, yeah. Me and Sid had that away. I went, what? Really? And then, yeah, he told me the story and how it happened. So, what did he tell you then? He told me they went in to weigh a job up to steal a load of stamps. They were weighing a job up, seeing how they could break in, or a way of getting in and out without being seen. And my dad was looking around, and Sid went to my dad, come on, Reg, we've got to go. My dad's like, what, oh, oh, I'm not finished. And he said, we've got to go. And as I went out of the place, and he moved his coat and he went, here, yeah, Reg. And my dad, and I've got to tell you, my dad said, this is his words, Fucking hell, Sid, what the fuck do you think we're going to do with that? And off they went, gone. 
Gary explained that the Stanley Gibbons stamp exhibition that the cup was stolen from was a good target on a quiet Sunday morning. We've heard how a maintenance man locked the doors of the room where the trophy was on display. I picked up a long wooden bar with closed on it and put it between the door handles of the doors of the rear entrance to the exhibition hall. The wooden bar went through all four handles and that's how I left it. But as security guard John McLaren's told us, that provided scant protection for the cup. The metal plates on the doors had been unscrewed, but it had been chained on the outside. So all they had to do was unscrew eight screws, eight bloody screws. Q Gillier made light work of the slack security at the exhibition. His old friend Bobby said he had acted on the spur of the moment. There was no inside man or grand plan. He was out and about over in Westminster. He used to get over there quite a bit. He had some good little touches over in Victoria and that way. He was in there and he saw the door was chained up and no one was about. I don't know if you remember those old school doors with brass handles. Well, he just unscrewed them. They had it padlocked with a chain, but he just unscrewed the handles. He didn't really go for the cup, but there it was. What he used to call the prize. Whenever he nicked anything, he always called it the prize. It was about your stamp, Tom, so not a big bloke. He braced himself to lift it and nearly fell backwards. He said it was so light. There was no intrinsic value in it, you know, gold-wise. The security men was on lunch. I suppose they got a nice bollocking when they got back. Cugalier was a professional thief who would normally spend months carefully planning every detail of a job. But this was simply an opportunist theft. All it took was a sharp mind, a screwdriver and a lot of bottle. According to Gary and Bobby, he walked in to case the joint for stamps worth 50 million and walked out with a World Cup trophy. This was no ordinary theft. The Queen was supposed to be handing the cup to the winners and now it had vanished. Overnight, the thief became Britain's, even the world's most wanted man. And yet, the statuette of the goddess Nike was only gold-plated silver and was worth very little melted down. There was no chance of flogging it down the East Street Market, that was for sure. They'd have thought that was solid gold. So of course, that would have been a fortune. But it turns out it wasn't, so it weren't really worth a lot. Only to FIFA. So that's the, what I was going to get to, because you said it, your dad would always say, no point in stealing something if you haven't got someone to sell it to. It's a bit hard to sell the World Cup, but then if it was solid gold, that would make sense, they could have melted it down. Yeah, they could have done that. That's why my dad was a bit annoyed as well. He's like, what the fuck? You know, they didn't plan on stealing it, so why steal it? They had other plans. Did Sydney ever tell you this, or did this all come from Reg? Initially, it came from my dad. He told me this story. And then my dad would have said, oh, Gal knows, you know, and then that opened the door, and Sid, my uncle Sid, after that, he just, he told me bits and bobs, what he did about the World Cup and he wasn't bothered about telling me. Your dad was obviously very sensibly concerned about the fact that they had the World Cup and he could imagine the huge repercussions that this would have. How was Sydney about it? I'd imagine he probably just laughed and said, let's get out of here, we'll talk about it when we get sorted. But I can imagine him just laughing. Come on, Rich, let's, let's go, quick. So was, he, was Sydney a cool operator then? It sounds like he, it'd take a lot to get him worried about anything. Absolutely. Cool as a cucumber. Yeah. Well, nothing phased him. Nothing worried him. No. I think he had a bit of a sharp temper, but I've never seen it. As we've heard, Cugalier associated with some nasty men. Don't believe the romanticised rubbish about big-hearted villains in the good old days. Most were ruthless. We know from the records that Hugh Gallier was convicted of at least one armed robbery. As a young man, Gary got an accidental glimpse of what he was really up to. One day I'd done some work on my uncle's car, a Mercedes he had, and I opened the boot and there's a bulletproof vest in the boot. So what's that tell you? I don't know. So that was Sydney's car. Sydney had a bulletproof vest in the back of his car. He would have been a fairly old man by that time. He had a two-tone green Mercedes. And I was 19 then, when he had that. You'll have to do all the sums. You're listening to Stealing Victory. I'll be back after a short break. 
This is Stealing Victory. So when Kugelier was around 60 years old, he was still committing crimes that meant he could be shot at. So there was a good chance he might be doing some shooting too. Like so many criminals of his generation, money burned a hole in Kugelier's pocket and he would spend it on cars, clothes, women and his friends and family. The very first car I remember, it was like an Audi Quattro or an Audi something, right? Real nice Audi. And then he had a couple of Audis after that. He had a red Porsche and a couple of Mercedes. He had a two-tone Mercedes, which was beautiful. Oh, do you know what? He said to me, Gal, I've got this all singing, all dancing stereo. Can you fit it for us? It's like, oh, it'll take me a while. He said, that's all right, I'm going out with your dad. Yeah, he'll fit it for us. I said to him, I'm going to have to go and get some parts. So I, I take advantage of this. I've got this lovely Mercedes. I'm going to drive around and see if I can meet anyone, see anyone, see me mates. Look at this motor. Couldn't find anyone, could I? <laughs> but he loved cars then. He would have lots of, lots of nice cars, nice clothes, but he would spend his money. He was a very generous man as well, was he? Very generous, yeah, yeah. And then what about women? Apparently um, Sid was good with the ladies. Absolutely. Always chatting the birds. Always had something to say to the girls. Even when he was older, was he chatting up the younger ladies all the time? Oh, I don't matter what age. Right. Yeah, anything from about 25 upwards. He didn't give a monkeys, yeah. Chasing ladies got Kugelier into a lot of trouble with his wife, Nell. Sid was a womaniser, and Nell threw him out many times. He always had a couple on the go. He was a good-looking bastard. Him and his mate Danny was out one Friday night and then on the Saturday they was out with the wives. He went through and there at the long bar was these two birds they'd been with the night before. Danny turned around and said, Sid, on your toes, old Bill's in there. So they grabbed the wives and got out sharpish. Known as QE to his mates, Kugelier was a trained carpenter. He also worked at Guy's Hospital and in a home for people with learning difficulties. And like many of his contemporaries, Kugelier took great pride in his appearance. He was very smart, always immaculately dressed, always had a nice car. He wore shoes that were 40, 50 quid then. You could only get them at Russell and Brondy's. I hate to think what they'd cost now. He used to have his suits made at Harris's down at Lower Marsh at the cut. Always handmade suits, immaculate in dress, immaculate in appearance, thick hair, That got him in more trouble with the police than anything, his hair. People would say, yeah, he had a thick mob of hair, and they'd say, oh, it's Sid. In the days after the cup was stolen, Kugelier would have been worried about just that. D.I. Buggy and his flying squad colleagues were out in force, putting the pressure on informants and criminals. By then, Kugelier was well known to the Yard detectives. In March 1966, he was 39 years old and had been in and out of prison all of his life. He'd finished his last sentence for the mailbag robbery only a couple of years earlier. If former Flying Squad detective Peter Kirkham were in buggy shoes, what would he have been doing? I'd just kick as many doors in as I could find and be as much of a nuisance as I could be until I either found it or it got given back to me. And, you know, we used to do it with suspects all the time. If we couldn't find the suspect, they'd gone missing. We'd just be as much of a nuisance as possible until the group or the family or whoever got fed up with us being a nuisance and gave them in. That undoubtedly would be the only way forward. The day after Ted Betchley was arrested as part of the police sting operation close to Kugelier's home, 80 flying squad detectives descended on the area. They searched 200 properties, pulling up floorboards, smashing into walls and scouring gardens. They didn't find anything, but then Kugelier was one step ahead of them. Gary tells the story of where his dad and uncle hid the cup. It got stored or hidden in my uh, mum's side, my granddad's coal bunker. They hid it in there until they decided what they were going to do with it. And that coal bunker, that house was where? No, it was in Luton, but I can't remember the name of the road. He had it in his motor and he was driving along and there was police somewhere and he shit himself thinking, oh, no, I've got to wave it up to now. Luckily for the brothers, the officers waved him through. According to the story, the World Cup then spent a few days gathering soot in a coal bunker in Luton, a town north of London. So how did it end up outside the house of Pickles' owner Dave Corbett at 50 Beulah Hill in South London? There's an intriguing statement in the police files from Dave's former neighbour, civil servant Kathleen Mills, 
made shortly after the cup turned up. Kathleen described seeing a suspicious looking man outside Dave's house on the Friday morning. That was two days before it appeared. So as I walked past 50 Bula Hill, I saw a car in the driveway of the house. It was beige coloured. I don't know the make, but it had a, a rather square back like a van. I seem to remember there was one man sitting in the car, there was a man standing by the car, and another man on the pavement outside. He was rather suspicious looking. He wasn't a nasty looking character. He was very well dressed and seemed to be edgy. I thought that the men in the car just didn't fit with the surroundings. The man I remember most of all was the man outside on the pavement. He had his hands in his pockets and he was walking in and out of the driveway, up to the car and back. He was between 25 and 30 years old, medium height, 5'8", 5'9", medium build, black hair, or at least very dark. His hair was short, cut all over. As I said before, he was well dressed, like a clerical type, but not the bowler hat type. He was good looking, but there was nothing distinctive about him. I think I may be able to recognise the man again, but more by his hair and his clothes. We've heard how Cugalier would often be identified by his black hair, and the description of this suspect is similar to the man seen by two witnesses at the Westminster Hall at the time of the theft. As well as the hair, we know Cugalier was around 5 foot 8, handsome, of medium build, and was a snappy dresser. He was also certainly not the bowler hat type. That sounds like Sid. He would be there for something like that, because he wasn't very trusting of anybody. When I read the neighbour's statement to Bobby, he was confident the man pacing the driveway was his old friend, Hugh Galeer. If something was being handed over, Sid would be there. He would be the last one. It was probably him who put it in the hedge, because he would like to place it itself. I would say the one standing outside the car would be Ted, and the one driving the car would be Reg. And I would say it was their Bedford Dormobile. It was like a van, had sliding doors on it so they could jump in and out of them. Could it have been Cugalier? I had to ask Dave Corbett if he had ever heard of the man. And in terms of Sidney Cugalier, you never yeah. heard that name. I've no. heard that name. It's yeah. a, I mean, it's a name you won't forget, wouldn't it? It sounds like a um, 18th century villain, doesn't he? <laughs> Mr Cugalier. So Dave said he didn't know Cugalier. He thought the man his neighbour had seen might have been his landlord. Perhaps it was. Or perhaps it was Cugalier casing the place in preparation for stashing the cup there later, for it to be found by an innocent passerby like Dave. But neither Bobby, Gary, nor my original source could tell me precisely how the cup got to Dave's garden. But we know from the records that once it did, the police investigation was closed. Cugalier had escaped justice and would have never been publicly named as the thief had it not been for my tip-off. Perhaps because he had become so well known to the police, Cugalier changed his name by deed poll to Kingsley in 1964 when he left prison for the mailbag robbery. In 1969, the law caught up with him again. He got eight and a half years for a plot involving £100,000 in fake fivers. His brother Reggie got six years. Then, hidden away in the National Archives, I found a gem. It's the sole surviving record of Cugalier's own words. The three-page application to appeal against his sentence for the forgery case is handwritten by the man himself, in neat writing and with good spelling. My age, after leaving this present sentence for forgery, would put me well past any danger of my being involved with any crime or offences in the future, and I do feel that this sentence is unduly very harsh and will do nothing but harm to myself and my family and that society has been more than repaid. I humbly ask you, gentlemen, to seriously consider my case and to alter my collective sentence to one of five and a half years. Referring to his sentencing hearing at the Old Bailey, Cugalier added, It was pointed out to the judge that on leaving prison in 1964, I had changed my name by deed poll and was a very ordinary, hard-working person until I became involved with the people in this forgery offence, one of whom was my own brother. I didn't go looking to break the law. Others came to me. So when Cugalier stole the cup, he was, in his own words, a very ordinary, hard-working person. 
On December the 30th, 1971, Master D. R. Thompson, Registrar of Criminal Appeals, refused his application. Unsurprisingly, Cugalier kept committing crimes into his 70s. He had to because he had nothing to show for the millions he must have made over the years. No savings or investments. I know on the last thing he went on, he was quite old then, 75 maybe. They robbed a security van. They actually took it in Devon's Road in the East End. They had a lock-up on the route on Long Lane in Bermondsey. They drove it into there and they had it all rigged out so the signal got interfered with and it came to a lot of money. Hell of a lot of money. You're talking about a couple of mil. Cugalier had split from his wife Nell and was living with another woman in his later years. He died aged 79 of prostate cancer in St Thomas's Hospital in 2005. It was three years after his only child Leslie had also succumbed to cancer. Bobby remembers how Leslie's death affected his old friend. He died of a broken heart. It was a shaky wreck after she died. But even at the very end, Cugalier couldn't escape the law. Gary again. Well, what's a bit ironic, yeah? He was in, on his deathbed, so to speak, in a room in a hospital, laying in his bed, and he said, he said to me, Dad, all the fucking rooms I'm in, look at the plaque on the wall. This room was donated by such and such police force in London. He said, and I'm in this fucking room by the police. He said, they're getting the last word, aren't they? At their funeral, Sidney and Reggie both had wreaths in the shape of the Jules Rimet trophy, but they both died having never been publicly unmasked as the brothers who stole the World Cup. I once heard a journalist describe working on long-term investigations as like being stuck in a dark room while feeling your way around for the light switch. You spend time banging your shins on bits of furniture and blindly hitting walls and doors until hopefully you find it. For me, that switch went on when I got Sydney Q's full name. That shone a spotlight on the work I'd done previously, connecting the dots. Suddenly I could see the bigger picture. Each tip-off, clue and statement on its own was meaningless, but together they formed a cohesive whole. Let's go back and look at that evidence. We've heard from Frank Baldwin, the son of Betchley's solicitor, Freddie Baldwin. Frank believes his dad helped to cut a deal between the police and thieves to get the cut back. Months after I interviewed Frank, I found evidence that strongly supported his theory. First, there was the front-page splash of the Sunday Mirror, written the night before Dave Corbett found the cup, predicting World Cup back in 48 hours. Crime reporter Norman Lucas had good contacts within Scotland Yard. How could they have been so sure it would come back within 48 hours? It proved Frank's deal theory. And there was another piece of evidence buried in the official papers. In 1971, Cugalier was jailed for forgery along with a deaf cartoonist who drew fivers so perfectly he was reported to be a menace to the Bank of England. What jumped out at me from the court documents was the name of Cugalier's solicitor. Yes, it was Betchley's solicitor, Freddie Baldwin. In terms of this document that I'm showing you, this is the first time you've seen it, I take it? Yes, it is, yes. But it's, I find it really interesting because you've really confirmed what I've always thought and that my father probably knew the thieves somehow or knew them through someone else. But this just shows that he, he was connected with them, at least in another case. Bobby also confirmed that Cugalier knew Freddie Baldwin and his chief clerk, Harry Stevens, having to call on their services regularly over the years. When I asked if he knew whether Cugalier used Baldwin, this was his reaction. Always, always. They was like best of pals, Sid and Fred. If he was driving past Fred's offices when out on one of his forays, he'd pop in and see him and have a cup of tea with him and Harry Stevens. He trusted Fred implicitly. He got him out of a lot of trouble. He only worked with the best Fred Baldwin. They knew all the crooked old Bill and who they could approach and who they couldn't approach. He knew all the coppers, all the local nicks. They knew everyone in the courts. Bobby says Cugalier was also a good friend of Ted Betchley, the middleman caught in the undercover sting operation. Sid and Ted knew each other very well. They lived five minutes' walk from each other and were two old thieves together. For years, they both drank in the old King's Arms on the Woolworth Road and the Reform Club up the Elephant End. 
That community was very close-knit, and Sid and Ted's families knew each other as well. I'd now heard all I needed to know. We started with black taxi driver John Dickens telling police about a passenger he dropped off at the Methodist Central Hall on the morning of the theft. He was uh, thin-faced, between 30 and 40 years of age, about 5'8 tall, wearing dark trousers, uh, a black raincoat. His hair was black, greased and, and pushed back. There may have been a pattern in the middle of his hair. He had a sallow complexion. The description fits Cougalier down to a T and it's almost identical to one given by a security guard of a suspect he saw in the hall a few minutes later. Bobby tells us Cougalier would target upmarket hotels, opening cabinets and doors with his skeleton keys. Our taxi passenger had been picked up from just such a spot. So a passing comment from a source of mine over a cup of coffee had resulted in the 1966 World Cup thief finally being unmasked. But why did it matter? The trophy had been returned and England had won it. Sidney Cugalier was dead and the crime was history. Well, as I said at the start, there's always more than one version of history. And history is just a collection of stories we tell ourselves to try to make sense of a scary and unpredictable world. The trouble is, often the stories are oversimplistic. Sometimes they're untrue. Before my tip-off, I knew a superficial version of the history of 1966. It was a feel-good story for us English. We were the world champions after Pickles, the black and white collie, saved the day. But after digging beneath the surface, I discovered that lots of what went on didn't reflect well on us as a nation. The most shameful aspect was the treatment of the real heroes of 1966, the England team. And what became of the Jules Rimet trophy? It had survived being hunted by the Nazis during the Second World War and being stolen in 1966. In 1970, Brazil thrashed Italy in the World Cup final in Mexico, making them three times winners. The rule stated any country to get a hat-trick of victories would keep the trophy forever. So it went on display at the Brazilian Sports Confederation offices in Rio. Then, on the night of December the 19th, 1983, the building's night watchman was overpowered by a gang of robbers and the cup was stolen again. At the time of the robbery, the Rio police chief said it had been melted down into gold bars. The figurine depicting Nike, the Greek goddess of victory, has been missing ever since. So much for the claim in 1966 that even Brazil's thieves loved football too much to steal the World Cup. But was it really melted down? We know the trophy was gold-plated silver, so it can't have been made into gold bars. So if it wasn't melted down, where is it now? Perhaps somewhere out there today, there's a Brazilian Sidney Cugalier reclining in his hammock at home admiring the goddess on his mantelpiece as her golden wings sparkle in the tropical sun. Stealing Victory is an original Audi production. If you've enjoyed listening, then please do like us on your podcast app. Leave a review and subscribe. Our hashtag is Stealing Victory, all one word. More information can be found at audi.co forward slash Stealing Victory. Stealing Victory is written and hosted by me, Tom Pettifor, with thanks to everyone at the Daily Mirror for their support during the investigation. And a special thanks to my Mirror colleagues, Tom Carlin and Phil Coburn, and of course, my original source. I'd also like to thank everybody who's contributed to make this investigation possible, and the actors who played parts in the reconstructions. Sound design is by Norman Goodman. Theme music by Nick Reynolds and Edward Rose. Title music by Guy Farley. Executive editor is Owen Bennett-Jones. Editor-in-chief, Andrew Sampson. And series producer is Zach Brophy.